We all start out from ignorance. The Buddha himself started out from ignorance. But we have this ability to learn, and it's this ability to learn, this willingness to learn, is what can take us to awakening. The first thing we know is, when we're born is that there's suffering, there's pain. A little baby comes out of the womb and cries. It's hungry and it cries. The body does all kinds of weird things that the baby doesn't understand, and so it cries. And the poor parents trying to figure out what's wrong. Sometimes it's easy enough to figure out, but sometimes it's not. As the Buddha once said, when our reaction to pain, our reaction to suffering, is twofold. On the one hand, there's bewilderment. Why is this happening? What's happening? And then secondly, is there someone who can help me get past this pain? Bewilderment and search. And it's a search that gets us out. Now the problem is, a lot of times that search is directed by bewilderment, too. So sometimes we hit it right, sometimes we hit it wrong. And it's enough to drive you crazy. They talk about an experiment where they put a pigeon in a, in a box. And they have a control. And with the control, when the red light comes on, there's going to be no food. When the green light comes on, the pigeon pecks at the little button and food will come out. And that pigeon is contented. With well, the other pigeon has a red light and a green light, and sometimes when the red light is on, the food will come out, and sometimes it won't. Sometimes it comes out when the green light is on, and sometimes it doesn't. That pigeon goes crazy. You look at all the things that cause the suffering in life, and it is really bewildering, and it's enough to drive you crazy. Fortunately, we've had people who've been through this before us, and can not only help to relieve some of our sufferings, but also can explain why they're caused. So we can begin to explore on our own, understand on our own. This is the pattern of the Buddhist teachings. He was willing to risk everything in his life, eventually, on this one question. Is there a way out of suffering that's total, that gives total freedom from suffering? And he put his life on the line, went out into the forest, abandoned his family, abandoned his wealth, abandoning not only the comforts of home, but also the, the self-respect that comes from being a responsible parent, responsible son. Because this other problem burned inside. And he had to experiment. He had to try all kinds of different things, studying with different teachers, trying extreme austerities for many years. None of that worked. And then he tried something else. How about getting the mind in a good state of concentration? And from that point, he was able to find the way out of suffering. It was all very paradoxical. He wanted to get past desire, but he couldn't just snuff out desire by exposing himself to all kinds of pain. He had to use his desire for comfort as a path. You look at the way he experimented, and it's, you see a lot of it nowadays, too. Kids who totally indulge themselves in all kinds of drugs and intoxicants, and then when they straighten themselves out, they go into the other extreme. Stop. 
starve themselves, impose all kinds of harsh regimens on themselves. And neither extreme works. He found that you have to use a certain kind of desire to go beyond desire, to get beyond the processes of becoming. You have to learn how to do the processes of becoming very skillfully. It was a very paradoxical kind of path that he found, which is one of the reasons why he despaired after finding the end of suffering, despaired of teaching that path to anybody else. But then convinced that there would be people to understand, he went ahead and started teaching. You notice all the risks that he took. Because again, as I said, like us, he started out with ignorance. And so as we follow him on the path, we have to take some risks, too. And his teaching on karma, his teaching on rebirth, his teaching on the nature of the, how our sense of self is made. Some people find it immediately appealing. Some people find it off-putting. And the Buddha himself could offer no empirical proof that these teachings were true. He said, if you put them into practice, you will find that you can prove it for yourself, but you have to be willing to take them as working hypothesis to begin with. What he offered was a pragmatic truth, pragmatic proof, excuse me, that if you accept the idea that your actions really make a difference in your life, you'll tend to act in ways that are less harmful. You'll take more responsibility for your actions. If you accept the idea that your life is shaped by your past actions and your present actions, there's a way out. If you believe that everything is shaped by the past, there's no way out at all. Or if you believe that your actions have no real impact on anything, that closes off the way as well. So we can't wait to have everything proven to us before we attempt the path. And the thing that pushes us into the path is the fact that we do suffer. We've got to find the way out. So we take the chance, we take the risk. And this is an important element in the path all the time. You have to experiment. If you want to know, if you're afraid of making a mistake, or if you're afraid of causing bad karma, and you keep holding back, holding back, holding back, you never learn. You look at the Buddha's instructions to his son, and how to look at his actions, and how to learn from his actions. He starts out by saying, try to avoid acting on unskillful intentions. How do you know if his intention is skillful? Well, if it's obviously any greed or anger or delusion in there, you don't act on it. But many times you don't see, especially if it's delusion, you don't see it. But if you do see anything unskillful in your intentions, don't. If everything looks okay, go ahead. If while you're doing something you see that actual harm is being caused, then you stop. But if you don't see any harm, keep at it. And then after the action is done, then you look back, see what the actual results are. And if it turns out that you made a mistake, you resolve not to repeat it, and you go talk it over with somebody you respect. If you don't see that you made any mistakes, okay, then take joy in the fact that you're training, you're learning, and keep on trying to learn. In other words, the Buddha didn't say, don't make mistakes. He said, this is how you do your best to avoid them, and this is how you learn from them when you find that you do. There's an element of risk in every action. So realize that as you practice. You can't be timid.
Now, this doesn't mean that you're brazen and making mistakes, but simply that you do your best to avoid them. But you get into areas where you're really not sure. As long as your intention looks good, go ahead. Then you can learn from it. Those kinds of mistakes are a lot easier to take than the ones that you knew ahead of time that it was going to be bad and you went ahead and did it anyhow. Those are the mistakes you try to hide from yourself. Pretend that they weren't mistakes or pretend that you didn't know. And that creates more ignorance, more delusion, which you don't want. Even this method of meditation that we're working here, following here, it was the result of somebody's experimenting. And John Lee walked into the forest one summer for the rains retreat, walked three days into this one little village, Hill Tribe's village, way up in the mountains. And soon after he arrived there, he had a heart attack. No doctor, no medicine. And he knew he was going to have to walk back out at the end of the three months. And so he started using the breath to heal himself. He didn't give up. He tried different methods, tried different ways of working with the breath energy, and he found what worked. And he came back, wrote down the method, and you read his Dharma talks from the remainder of his life. He lived for another, another eight or nine years. He was continually experimenting with different ways of working with the breath energy, different ways of conceiving the breath, trying different things out. And that's the attitude you have to have as a meditator. Keep trying things out. Because no matter what you read of other people's practice, what you read of their the insights that gave them awakening. There's no guarantee that your path is going to follow theirs. I mean, there's some general maps that are out there, and they're useful. But you have to learn how to use the map. And not anticipate too much. Use the map after you've had some experience meditating and you look at your your meditation, the different results you've been getting, and you begin to see a pattern. And so you write that on a post-it note. And keep that in mind as you meditate. Then after all you get to know the territory a little bit better. And you find that well it's not quite what it looked like on the map. So you take down the post-it note, put up another one with a slightly different map. The point where you really know is when you finally do come across a deathless, something that does not have any conditioning of space and time. You put that on a post-it note, just to check, just to be sure. In other words, you're always experimenting, always taking risks, but this is how you learn. And it makes the practice an adventure. You're learning something new. You're not just regurgitating what somebody else said, or forcing the mind into a mold. It's not the case that you can simply program yourself or clone awakening. But the Buddha does, he gives you some pointers. He said, there's something really valuable here in this field. And this is how you go about looking for it, and when you find something, this is how you test it. Say that he says that there's gold in the field. Well, he gives you instructions on how to look for the gold and how instructions on how to test whatever shiny things you find in the field to make sure they really are gold, not something else. And then he sets you loose in the field.
So there are bound to be mistakes on the path, but you can always learn from your mistakes. And as you learn how to monitor your actions and make adjustments, you gain more and more confidence in what you're doing, that you can handle any situation. That comes up in the course of the search. And the point where you really know is when you finally do get to that point where there is no more suffering, there's no more stress in the mind, when I mean, there's still the, the pains of the body. But the mind itself has no pain, no suffering. There's nothing that weighs on the mind at all. There's nothing inconstant, nothing stressful. That's the point of real knowledge. Up to that point, you're still groping. I mean, your first taste of awakening it confirms to you, yes, the Buddha really did know what he was talking about. But the point of full knowledge is when there's no more suffering left at all. So on the one hand, as the Buddha said, even to the stream enterers who were present at his passing away, he said, don't be complacent, be heedful. There's more to learn. There's, there's still some risk in the practice. As long as you're comfortable and confident in the fact that you can learn. And there's no reason to be timid. And every reason to keep on exploring.